book of Jude. I'm going to spend a few weeks going through this very short letter, but very powerful letter. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for your kindness, for the opportunity as a church to gather in this place to worship. It is a privilege. It is an honor to be able to know you, the one true God. And as we open up your word, please open up our minds to see your love, your kindness, in giving us truth. That is what we are, a people of the truth. Lead us, God, to guard it, to love it, to contend for it, as we are told here, and to see truth win the victory over the lies of our culture. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 of the book of Jude, where he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a number of parables, one of which is the parable of the wheat and the weeds. A farmer, representing Jesus, he goes out and sows his seed in the field. But during the night, his enemy, who's the devil, comes along and sows his seeds in it too. And his seeds are weeds. And when all those seeds come up, the weeds are mixed in there with the wheat, and only at the harvest will the good be separated from the bad. And so Jesus comes along and he he explains this parable to his disciples that this is the way that it is in the world that we live in. The sons of the kingdom, they do live alongside the sons of hell. And there's always going to be an intermixing of these in this life until the Lord returns and sorts them all out in the final judgment. That's the world. That's the way it will always be in the world that we live in. Weeds will be mixed in among the wheat. But that is not the way that it is to be inside the church if we can help it. And when I say the church, I don't mean simply in a gathering like this that there can only ever be just believers that are here in our midst. It's as if we check your Christian card at the door and only allow those with the card to come in. No, we welcome anybody to come into a gathering like this and see how we teach, how we worship the Lord, the uniqueness in some ways of our church, for sure, representative of the kingdom of God, the way that we love one another here. But there will always be a group of people who make up the true, actual church. A lot of folks are going to come and go, in and out, appear, disappear, But there are some who have committed themselves to build up the believers here, to serve, filled with the Holy Spirit, use their resources for the gospel ministry, to hold other people accountable, to be held accountable by others who are here. Most of those people would be the membership here at the church. We've got three people who are joining the church today during the business meeting. If you want to hear some testimonies, stick around with us. You'll get to hear the story of how God has saved them and what He's doing in their lives. We do our best to try to ensure that we have a regenerate, born-again membership, meaning we do our best as leaders to make sure that each person who joins this church is good wheat sown by the Lord so that we can keep His field as weed-free 
as possible because weeds can be pesky things. They hinder the growth of the wheat. If you've ever grown a garden, you know this. You don't just weed the garden because it looks better when the weeds are out of it. You weed the garden because they sap the resources of the good crops. It can be that way in the church too. And so in Jesus' parable, the wheat and the weeds, they grow alongside each other and they will be separated in the final judgment. But our aim of the church is not the same. We want to keep the chore as pure and spotless as possible as we wait on Jesus to return. That's what Jude is teaching in this letter. It's a short letter. It's only one chapter. It's probable that a number of the people here have maybe never read this letter, or at least maybe not have read it in a long time. It's easily overlooked. Most of the time, people are scurrying along trying to get to the book of Revelation, and so this book is in the shadow of that one and probably just gets overlooked. Jude here identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. And so whoever this Jude was and whoever this James was, it would have been obvious to the first people who read this letter. They would not have needed clarification. Which Jude are you? Which James is, is, are you the brother of? But all these years later, it is debated. The name Jude or Judas belongs to at least eight men in the New Testament. But it is most likely that this particular Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. The full brother of James, who was the leader in the church of Jerusalem. The James who wrote the letter that goes by his name. So most likely... Jude is one of the several children born naturally to Mary and Joseph after the birth of Jesus. And like his brother James, when he opens up his letter, it seems that it is out of humility that Jude here does not make reference to the fact that he is the half-brother of Jesus. He simply says, a servant of Jesus Christ. He gives us the purpose of this letter in verse 3. He says he had intended to write to them about their common salvation. So he wanted to pick up his pen and write one thing, but he changed his mind somewhere along the way. He wanted to write about some of the gospel blessings that all of these people share in. Some victory, some promise that Jesus has won for them all in his life and his death and his resurrection, the joy that they've been brought into as the children of God. That was his hope. That's what he wanted to do. But something happened. He got some news that changed his direction. He says, I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write something else. And so what was it that made Jude rethink? What became urgent to him where he had to change his course? Apparently there was a threat to these people that it seems that they were unaware of or they were taking too lightly. And so surely if this news has reached Jude's ears, wherever he was out there, somebody had come along and told Jude something that is happening in this particular church. So if it's come to him somewhere... Apparently, it would have first come to the attention of those members in the church, those leaders in the church. They would have been aware of this. But whatever the case, they must not see it as the threat that it actually is. I think this often happens with us, does it not? When we have symptoms of some disease in our bodies. Somebody who knows you well comes along and says to you, you know, you don't look well. Are you okay? Yeah, it's just probably something that I ate. Like, no, no, no. Like, your skin is yellow. Like, you don't... No, that doesn't normally happen from foods that you eat. Like, no, you're just a worry ward. I'll be just fine. I don't know about you. Maybe you're not that way. Maybe you're the person who gets really 
upset at the thought of anything being wrong with your body. I'm the guy that's blowing it off like, ah, I'm all right. Sometimes we're going to take our symptoms lightly, avoid diagnosis. We don't want to go to the doctor. We don't want anybody in some ways to tell us the truth. And so it's possible that that is actually what is happening in this church. Somebody has noticed symptoms. Surely somebody has noticed symptoms of a great sickness, and the people are in a kind of denial stage. Oh, we're fine. But when Jude hears of it, he is the skilled doctor that assesses the situation and calls for immediate surgery. This is the situation as he prepares to write this letter about their common salvation, and now he tells them that he's writing to appeal to them to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. He wants these people to start fighting for the truth. Critical to the health of any church is truth. Truth is not something that we can take lightly as a people or just leave. It cannot be treated as nothing. It is not bendable. It is not shapeable. It's not subject to opinion. It is not changing over time. Truth is truth. And we live in a time when it is very unfashionable, is it not, to say things like that. To say that there is something true that applies to every person. That gives great offense. People would much rather talk about your truth, my truth, as if it changes from person to person. We do that so nobody gets offended, that nobody has to be told that they're believing something that is wrong. That might hurt their feelings. And that sort of thinking has and will invade the church in our country, in our city. And we have to believe that the enemy would love to sow his weeds right here at Cass Church. We could be tempted to not want to correct anyone to just want to be thought of as nice. So in the church, let's just act like we don't hold anything as authoritative. We've not been told anything by God in His Word, that there's not been a line in the sand drawn anywhere, but it has, has it not? We do have the truth. Jesus has revealed himself to us. And he is Lord, not just of those who know it, but Jesus Christ is Lord of every person who lives on the face of the earth, whether they know it or not. Revelation chapter 1 says that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth, which means if he rules over kings, he rules over everybody else too. He is the truth. He is the authority. And without Jesus, we stray into lies. A church is a group of people who together delight in and profess the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. And our aim together is to protect that truth for the good of our own souls, but also for the glory of God. So we guard it. We watch over it. We pay attention to anybody who might want to taint it, do something to the truth. So we'd better be pretty solid, should we not, on what the truth is. We can't protect what we don't know. And so there had better always be wise, godly men and women at Cass Church, skilled in truth, knowing what is right and knowing what is counterfeit. Or we will be led astray into the weird and the wonky. I know it's a wonky word, wonky. 
And there is a lot of that going on in places of worship in this city. Some of you all have been out there and have seen it for yourself. I've not. I just kind of get reports on this from others. I'm usually always here. But just because a place names Jesus' name, call themselves Christians, it does not mean that they teach the truth of God's Word. There are a lot of people who call themselves pastors that I would never allow to stand in this pulpit and say a word. They have something close to the truth. But the most believable lies are the ones that do have elements of truth to them. Otherwise, nobody would believe them. At least not many. And it's books like Jude that make it clear that we have to be serious about guarding the truth and not wimpy, wishy-washy, gullible, or man-pleasing Christians. There is a line in the sand that has been drawn that Jude says is the faith, not one of many faiths. It's not subject to each person's opinion and what they believe and how they interpret things. There is one thing called the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And by the way, you are the saints. Jude is not making a reference to any special group of Christians that Jesus loves and uses more than others. Saints that some of you had to learn about in Catholic school growing up. That is an example of false teaching, by the way. The only saints that the Bible ever mentions are the regular nobodies like me and you that Jesus has made somebodies by His grace. Saints means holy ones. And so you at one time, I at one time, we were unholy, separated from God, living in our sin, unclean. But then the grace of God, His power and His love collided with you and absolutely transformed you into what now can be called a saint, holy, because you've been joined to Jesus by faith who is holy. That's a saint. So he says here that there is a faith, the faith, that has been once for all delivered to the saints. And that this was already done then in the first century. It had been delivered. The package had come off the truck and landed on the porch. It was done. It was there. Once for all. Never needing to be delivered again. So this is the truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so whatever the apostles taught about Jesus in the first century, it contained all the truth that a disciple needed to know about him. Once for all, delivered. And yes, plenty has been learned, plenty has been explored, more deeply studied since then. A lot of books, a lot of papers have been written exploring the riches of the gospel. That is true. But the essentials of the truth that are necessary for any believer to know about Jesus, to love Jesus, to serve Jesus, it was all already there at that time 2,000 years ago. And so the truth had gone out like seed, and the children of the kingdom were sprouting up as wheat in the Lord Jesus' field. The church was pure, it was holy. A people who had experienced, he says, mercy, peace, and love. A people, he says, who were called, beloved by God, and kept for Jesus. This was the Lord Jesus' field. His people. And these people are threatened by what Jude calls certain people in verse 4. There's certain people who have come in. So Jesus has that field of wheat sown, his church, and the devil comes along behind him and sows the field with certain people who are weeds. And the bulk of this letter that Jude writes describes who these certain people are, or better yet, what they're like. What do they do? What are they like? What are they pursuing? Jude does not give us any specific teaching of theirs. 
He's not like Paul who tells us in the book of Galatians that there are false teachers out there that are telling people they must be circumcised and they have to keep the law in order to be saved. He says that's a different gospel. Paul gets very specific. Here, Jude just kind of gives us some generalities. He doesn't get overly specific, but there is enough for us to glean from to make application. And so for today, we're going to look at just one verse to get us started on what these weeds look like, how to identify them, and that's there in verse 4. Look at verse 4 with me. He says, first off, these certain people have crept in unnoticed. They've crept in unnoticed. Not so different than what Jesus describes in that parable. The devil crept in at night unnoticed and sowed seed in the Lord's field. So it is here. These people creep. That's what they do. And I would say that anytime somebody is described as creeping, it's not a good thing, is it? Creeping just doesn't sound good. He's a creeper. Not good. Creepers want to avoid notice. They have plans that they don't want anybody else to pick up on. They don't want to be seen. They do their best to blend in at first, so nobody will think the wiser. So if somebody were to creep into our church, what might they appear to be? What might they want to project? Two people are talking and they discuss somebody. They say, oh, have you met so-and-so? Yes, he's a really nice guy. Seems to know his Bible well. That's a guy who comes in and he blends in, projects what other people want to see. You can't creep in unnoticed by being creepy, can you? Maybe like this, same type of conversation. You see the fellow with the trench coat, the ski mask, the gloves on, the giant suitcase he's dragging behind him? Well, th nobody's taught that guy to creep very well, have they? Because he is noticed, and he's not going to go very far. He doesn't show us his face. He doesn't show us his hands. He doesn't show us what's in his bag. We're noticing that guy. So Jude says that these certain people have crept in without other people being suspicious of them. They're able to blend in. Next, Jude says that these creepers are ones who have long ago been designated for condemnation. There are a few ways that this phrase could be taken, but I think that the most plain way is that nobody should be surprised that people have crept in. God told us that they would be there. The Lord himself, he is not surprised, and you should not be shocked either because those that creep in were prophesied about in the Old Testament. We were told they would come. And then the New Testament comes along and confirms, like in a letter like this, or in 1 John, or in Galatians, in many places that people crept in already there in the first century. As soon as the gospel goes out, the Satan, it, Satan is at work ensuring that he is sowing in the Lord's field. So they shouldn't be shocked about it. And all these years later, we should not be shocked either. God knows the time and the place of their arrival. So no matter how well they creep, no matter how well they blend in, God sees them and He wants the church to have its eyes, our eyes, opened up to see them too. So we should not be surprised when people try to creep into our church. Jude calls these certain people ungodly. This is a favorite word of his. He uses it six times in the 25 verses of this letter. Ungodly. What does he mean when he says that? It's a very general word, is it not? It might be overused at times. He's not trying to overuse it. He's trying to aptly describe 
who these people were. And there are two clauses at the end of verse 4 that explain what he means by ungodly. First, he says they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. They pervert, they twist grace into sensuality. No Christian wants to see grace twisted. It is a precious thing to the people of God, is it not? We know that it is grace, the power of God, the touch of God that has transformed us. Maybe you've seen the painting of Michelangelo that he did on the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel in Rome where God is reaching down and Adam is reaching up, their fingers close together. In some ways that is a picture of what grace is. Grace, God, reaches into the world and touches a sinner with his power and his love and he gives us new life. We call all of that just grace. But what grace is, it really is the power of God. It is not just some substance that's floating around out there. It is the work, the person of Jesus doing something directly in Brian's heart. Touching him, changing him, giving him eyes to see the gospel, giving him new loves and new tastes, leading him to hate sin that used to be in there, and now loving holiness. That's what we call grace. And that is precious to the Christian. And we cannot stand to see it tainted or twisted or blemished, abused in any way. But that is what these men were doing. They perverted grace into sensuality. What does that mean? It seems that it would go something like this. They would say, because you belong to Jesus now, you can kind of do whatever you want. All you have to do is go to confession. God will forgive you. He loves to forgive His children. And so, you can pretty much have as much sex with anybody that you want to. God will forgive. Yeah, you you can steal. You can lie. And in the end, it just won't really matter. Because God forgives. His grace is greater than our sin, is it not? No need to worry. No need to fight against your urges. At least not very hard. You're safe. And they might not have openly said that you can do whatever you want, but it certainly would have been implied. As long as you're sorry, or think you're sorry, or maybe someday you will be sorry. However it was communicated to these certain people who crept in, grace became a license to sin. It became a means or a conduit, a useful tool in their hands to be able to do what they really wanted. And it seems that what they really wanted was to have sex. And to excuse, oh, I slipped again. Oh, I did it again. But grace. And maybe they had no real intention of ever changing. But just use grace again and again as a reason to do what they wanted. And teaching the church and maybe leading other people into sin along with them. But what does grace really do in the life of somebody who has received it? Grace makes the people of God more careful not to sin. More grieved over sin. There is a brokenness inside when you do fall into sin or choose to sin because you hate sin. And you would scream out like Paul in Romans chapter 7, and he says, Who will deliver me from this body of death? But thanks be to God. So when we sin, we do not coddle it. 
We don't protect it. We don't nurture it. We don't excuse it. We confess it and we kill it. Lastly, these certain people, these creepers, what do they do? He says they deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. It might seem on its face that these people openly speak against Jesus, that they deny him with their words. They deny who he is. But think about it. Nobody can actually creep into any good, healthy church if they don't say that Jesus is Lord. Nobody creeps into the church by not naming the name of Jesus. Well, he says he's a Christian and wants to be our teacher, but strangely, he never talks about Jesus. That doesn't happen. You don't give people teaching posts who don't teach about Jesus. More likely, what Jude is talking about is that they do name the name of Jesus. They will speak of Jesus being Lord, but they deny him by their actions. So you have to watch them to be able to see their denial. Their fruit is not of God. They say they're the Lord's, but they don't love what the Lord loves. And maybe you've got to watch real close, or maybe you've got to watch them when they're not around other people. So they say they delight in forgiveness, but they don't forgive. They say they love holiness, but they don't love holy things. They speak of purity with their lips, but what do they do? They enjoy impurity with their bodies. They claim to be people of the truth, but they soil themselves constantly with lies. That's who they are. They are ungodly at their root. And that ungodliness, what does it do? It finds its way into their fruit. It grows on their branches. And you'll see it if your eyes are open. That's Jude 1 through 4. There's a lot more to come, and he does not spare his words. And these words are preserved by God, not just to tell us what happened to the church in the first century, but to tell us, to warn us of what is still happening in our midst today. And it is. So what are we to do? Three short applications, and we'll be done. Number one, commit yourself to the truth. Commit yourself to the truth. And so are you a person who is skilled in the truth, or at least growing in your skill of understanding truth and handling truth? Are you a humble learner of the Bible? Are you growing in your understanding of what it teaches? Are you a reader of good books? Do you listen to good podcasts? Do you surround yourself with godly people who will sharpen you? There has never been a time in the history of man when there have been more resources at your fingertips for you to learn truth. But there's a flip side to that too, isn't there? There has never been a time in the history of man where there have been more resources to fill your head with lies than there are right now. And so we also, number two, need to be a people who are not afraid to openly reject what is false. So that begs the question, just like with truth, are you skilled in seeing falsehood? Can you see it? Are you so well acquainted with the truth that when falsehood comes into your ears, you know it? Maybe you can't explain it perfectly well, but you just know it. Something's not right about that. And so we don't just need knowledge, though, in this. We need courage. We need to be a courageous people. So here, look at what Jude does. He doesn't just sit back and let it go on because he's afraid of hurting somebody's feelings. A lot of damage is done to the church by those who are more committed to being nice than they are committed to the truth of God. One of those two things wins. And they're like, ah, not going to say it. 
not going to talk about it, not going to confront. I don't want to hurt their feelings. Now, we do need to speak the truth in love, do we not? We need to do it in the right way, but so often that's not the problem. It's just a person lacks courage to say anything at all. Lastly, if you're committed to the truth, you're not afraid to reject what is false, you need to contend for the faith that has been delivered to us. Contend. Fight. In your sphere of influence, it doesn't mean that you're out there just throwing pot shots at everybody out there on social media behind some fake name so nobody knows who you are. No, like in your sphere of influence with people who know you, You've genuinely got influence in their life. They'll listen to you contend for the truth. And sometimes you might have to contend with people who are going to hate your guts and who maybe they don't really know you that well, but they're spewing so much falsehood, somebody's got to say something. And maybe that's you. This is the primary command in our text today. Contend. Wrestle. Agonize is the word that it, our word comes from, this word. Agonize. Battle. And you need to understand, he did not just send this letter to a pastor or the elders of a church. It is written to those who are called, beloved by God, and kept the group. It's written to the church at large. It's written to you. This is your responsibility There is a truth war that is going on in our culture, a war that has been going on in every culture since the snake slithered into the garden, and it is the responsibility of every faithful Christian at Kaz Church to guard this field, this little patch of grass, that's all we are, a little postage stamp in the kingdom of God. But it's your responsibility, it's my responsibility to guard this field from weeds. Commit to the truth. Reject what is false. Contend for the faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather in this place today and maybe even just have a wake-up call to open up our eyes to what is going on around us. This was a church, I'm sure a godly church that Jude wrote to, but their eyes were not open. They were on cruise control in some way. They were too tolerant of false teaching coming into the church, maybe for fear of not hurting somebody's feelings or being an obstacle to salvation, when in fact, when we stand for the truth, we are leading people toward salvation, not being a hindrance to it. And so God, please lead us to be a courageous people at Kaz Church. Please make us more skilled in seeing the truth and loving the truth and standing for the truth in our culture and in our church. Not being afraid to openly reject what is false. Leading us, God, to be also skilled in speaking that truth and genuine love for the people that we are talking to. Not just being combative because we love combativeness but caring so much about the truth that we can't stand to see it tainted. Loving Jesus so much that we can't stand to see his name dragged through the mud of lies. Make us that people. Please give us courage this week. Maybe somebody in this room is going to need to contend for the truth, the faith that has once for all been delivered to the saints. This week, maybe in their own home, maybe in a painful context, Lord, please strengthen them by your mighty grace to do it. And may they see fruit come from it. Stand by them in that hour, Lord. And make this church, Kaz Church, more and more holy and pure as we stand for the truth together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.